Hi, I'm Ted Smith. I'm an Associate Professor of Environmental Medicine at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. And I'm here today to present some work done with my collaborators, Heather Ness and Lauren Anderson, on co-creating wastewater-based epidemiology risk communication framework. This work, supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, has really chronicled the journey that we've been on through the whole pandemic. Our work in wastewater really started where most of the community's work did, which was trying to get a handle on whether this was going to be a useful and valid tool to assess community infection. And over time, as we were able to provide some utility to the public health department, we moved into the shifting focal points of the health department, things like vaccine uptake, things like trying to figure out what the health care delivery system risk was at any given time during the pandemic. And so, you know, in some ways, this presentation today is really a, a journey, you know, from the, the earlier days in the pandemic, trying to demonstrate the utility to the health department of this work to being ultimately a, a partner and a, a part of the public health response. This work really can't be done just by a research university. And our approach, which we think is a winning formula, is to let the university ask the research questions, try to advance the knowledge of the field, but really in service of, uh, in our case, the Louisville Metro Public Health and Wellness uh, Department, our city county public health agency, they are the ones who have been in charge of the response to the pandemic and doing the thoughtful planning about equity and disparity concerns in our community. So they're the customer, if you will. But on the other side, and this is a decision that we made at the outset, rather than sending a bunch of graduate students out to lift up manholes, which we've seen plenty of footage of researchers in sewers, we made the decision to go with our wastewater utility, Louisville Metropolitan Sewer District, MSD, they're the, the first mile in this work, and they're professionals at what they do. They're trained to handle this kind of hazardous material, and they know their infrastructure better than anybody else. And so our whole collaborative framework end-to-end -end has a multi-stakeholder kind of a flavor to it. Important in our work was really early in the pandemic, trying to make some decisions about the scale that we were gonna be working. And for many communities around the country and around the world, you know, they went to their wastewater treatment plant. It's a place where there's regulatory compliance monitoring going on all the time. There's regular equipment that's there, routine procedures. It's a very straightforward process at the wastewater treatment plant, which is wonderful. You know, high quality data, highly replicable. But one of the challenges that we recognized early was the fact that these treatment plants often aggregate very large percentages of the population. In our community, one of our treatment plants is a third of our entire city. And so we wondered if we were going to lose some of the important flavor of the differences between neighborhoods if we just went to the wastewater treatment plant. And so we ultimately came up with a rationale to answer a research question. You know, are there advantages to sampling in smaller catchment areas? And then also take a look at those big aggregation points at the wastewater treatment plant. So we divided our city up into 17 locations Five of those are wastewater treatment plants, and the remainder are smaller neighborhood catchment areas that feed into them. And came up with a framework that we published that is inclusion and exclusion criteria for what is a catchment area. And we have continued to look at that throughout the pandemic as a, an important question. You know, what are we trading off when we go to small areas versus big areas? When we focus on the risk assessment part of the decision making, everybody in this field has been wrestling with different kinds of dashboard presentations and reporting, and a lot of really good work has been done. Our journey, starting with trying to get a handle on how prevalent is infection in our community, was a balancing act of many different data points. Some of the data was really not available for the public, you know, whether you're talking about fatalities in particular areas, whether you're talking about specific vaccine uptake in different neighborhoods. We really had to sort of balance the information that the public would benefit from and the information that was truly for public health decision makers. And so you can see here in this slide, probably in the early 2021 period, we were just trying to cram as much 
data as we could into a visual display. And so you could see how much the infection there was in the wastewater. You could see what the vaccination coverage was. You could see what the incidence was of clinical cases. You could see what the demographics were in the catchment area. And the exercise at that point in time was to have smart people looking at all that information, like it was a situation room or war room or whatever the right analogy is. And we're looking at all these screens of all this information and you're just really trying to solve the puzzle. Well, that's a lot of information. What we realized the public health folks ultimately got frustrated with was they wanted an indicator. They didn't want to try to figure it out. They didn't want a treasure hunt. And, you know, it was a really important insight for us. You know, we thought we were doing everybody a great favor by giving them everything. And really what they wanted was the something that they could act on, the something that we could look for a change if we implemented some intervention. That led us, again, with the support of the Rockefeller Foundation to pursue a ranked risk framework. You know, so could we take all those numbers and could we turn it into one number? And you, know, you can see here we took, after lots of interviews with lots of these folks who were frustrated with all the different kinds of data, we went through kind of a logic model. We said, how much virus is in the wastewater? How has it been trending over the past few weeks? What is the incidence of cases in the community? How's that been trending in the last three weeks? What's the vaccination coverage, you know, high, medium, low? And then can we put weighting on each of those factors and add it up and create one number, an index number for all those catchment areas. And you can see on the right in the slide, they do fall in a nice rank order. And you can say, well, the one with the biggest index score is the neighborhood that we need to look at. That's the one we're gonna focus on. And in this particular slide, it's our Portland neighborhood. And then we could say, all right, what are we doing in Portland? What's the opportunity in Portland? That's a public health decision. That's not a wastewater decision, right? So they're thinking about boots on the ground, things they're doing, their local knowledge in these places. And so that was a really great exercise. And I think we got to a place where we had agreement, this is a great way to incorporate wastewater into public health decision-making. We went on to apply it to an intervention program. So we partnered with a company that does geo-targeted internet protocol advertising. So we bought digital ads with a geofence the size of the catchment area of concern. We picked a match control because we're researchers and we found a collection of neighborhoods that was just like that intervention neighborhood and ran other ads over there. And we could then start to see whether there was utility, right? If we said, let's let the wastewater in a weighted fashion guide an intervention, in this case, a messaging intervention, and let's see if it changes, in this case, vaccine uptake, which was probably the most useful thing we could do in an area that had runaway infection. And so that was a great kind of crunchy example of what could you do with this. Well, just when we're all getting comfortable with our index and talking about where the infection rates are high and the vaccinations are low, the pandemic shifted to a focus on variants and variants of COVID became the really big issue. So vaccination alone as a conversation was still not the whole picture because what if you end up with a variant that the vaccine can't protect you from. So wastewater epidemiology took on a new flavor for us. We started to do full genome sequencing of all the SARS virus that we pulled out of the wastewater. This is an impossible chart to read, but let me just tell you the punchline here is this is all of our catchment areas looking for all of the predominant variants over time. And every time it gets dark purple, that's a sign that a variant has taken over our entire community when it spreads across the whole box. So this is winter 2021, we start the sequencing work and we were able to, on a regular basis, find the next variant in one of our smaller catchment areas before a clinical case was reported. And uh, you know, I remember the governor you know, issuing reports and our particular county, which is one of the largest in the state, there were no clinical cases recorded yet, but I remember him shouting out that we found the uh, Omicron variant right there in the wastewater in Jefferson County, city of Louisville. So there was a lot of validation that this was a method, this was a, a tool that had some utility, even as the game changed or the end zone got moved, we continued to move with it. The work with genomic sequencing, we started doing not just in partnership with our county health department, but we started working with the state health department who is responsible for genomic surveillance for the Commonwealth of Kentucky for clinical samples. And so Dr. Vinita Aurora, who runs that program for the state, we would have a regular check-in then with him, in addition to our county health department, to say, well, what are you seeing across the state? This is the genetic variation we're seeing here in Louisville. 
if we find something that his lab had not seen in human clinical cases, it was an opportunity to say, well, should we be holding back more specimens in Jefferson County to see if we can find this thing that we see in the wastewater? Or alternatively, if he found something somewhere else in the state and he says, well, have you seen this yet in Jefferson County? We could go look in our database to see if we've ever seen mutations like that before. And so we developed this interoperable kind of exchange system. And it was, and goes on to this day, a kind of surveillance, a kind of proactive monitoring framework that we have that bridges clinical data and wastewater data so that we have the full picture. The ugly chart that I showed you a minute ago has been replaced with a much more colorful, I think of it as the competition, if you will. And so if we now cut it back to five catchment areas, you can see that we have one strain grow and then get replaced with another variant and get replaced with another variant. And that has been something we've been able to just track perfectly throughout this later stage of the pandemic. This is the perfect amount of information for a health department decision maker. Now, the picture today, when we combine the genomics with looking at the prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater, this is our sort of current version of the whole report. So we look at the levels in the wastewater, we overlay the clinical incidence, which lots of people do, of course. Then we take the CDC's guidelines, we look at hospitalization with COVID, and we look at ICU beds with COVID and we can see how trends in wastewater relate to the macro CDC risk framework. And what we've seen is about a month lead. Now remember, everybody's infected if we see it in the wastewater, so it's not that we're predicting future infection. It's we're seeing the infection in the community that proceeds by about a month, the activity in the hospital. So I think we all understand now that a lot of the hospital activity is a lagging indicator of where we are with the infections. But it's important to see that time and time again, this relationship, and then keeping track of the variants can help us understand when the, the timing between the two might get shorter or longer. We've also added the other data sources that are out there whenever possible. So we started incorporating our data into the CDC's National Wastewater Surveillance System. And so we provide our health department with a snapshot of what our region looks like from the news dashboard. So, you know, we might have our own localized reprieve. The levels are going down and maybe we would all celebrate that if not for our surrounding states, you know, maybe increasing, right? And, and we want to sort of a little bit like a weather system, want to understand what our local weather is and want to understand what people are experiencing downwind, upwind. And then recently we've partnered with our utility and the SCAN project, and that's helped us jump into other pathogens like monkeypox. And so you can see here from the SCAN project, we're getting a readout on monkeypox virus levels in our wastewater, which to date uh, have been none detected in the one large treatment plant that's submitting those samples. What we're looking at going forward is this panvirome approach. And so working with our genomics core, we've set up a special panel working through the methods for blocking hyperprevalent things that aren't dangerous and tuning it so that we can see the pathogens of interest for us. And so that tuning for doing next generation sequencing across dozens of pathogens is hard work. The good news is we're finally coming out of it and we're able to, we think in the next week or so, perhaps by the time this is being shared at the conference, we've got a list of several dozen high value target pathogens that are respiratory GI, including some microbial resistant organisms. And so for us, the future is to move to have a general capability that is broadly surveilling a wide range of pathogens of interest to public health. And we will likely go through the same exercise we went through with COVID with a number of these other diseases. So what are the cases? What's the case data that we have? How does that correspond to the geography of the wastewater? What is the relationship between levels of things? What are limits of detection? And, you know, we expect that it was useful to go through it with COVID because I'm pretty sure it's going to be pretty much the same movie and we're going to have to sort of go through the same incorporation of using the wastewater data in companion with all the other public health and healthcare delivery system data that's out there. And with that, I want to say thank you to the conference organizers. A big thank you to the many people that contributed this research across our university and across our community. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.